will experience. Furthermore, Sweden will be in a better position to handle that cost since its, its economy shrank by much, much less than ours. The costs of the UK COVID response I have mentioned so far are just the costs to the Treasury and so to public services. Yet other and probably rather greater costs have been borne by many people in many forms. While the COVID response aimed to protect us from COVID, it also led to a reduction in health and well-being in other respects. For example, a hip replacement is a highly effective procedure that enables people to be mobile and to avoid pain. Many patients describe it as life-changing. The average cost to the NHS at £10,000 is low. Unsurprisingly, the number of hip replacement procedures carried out here has been rising. In 2019, there were almost 100,000 uh, um, hip replacement procedures carried out in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. In 2020, the number almost halved to just 50,000. So from that year alone, 40,000 patients will be continuing to be immobile and in pain who would have been treated. This is just one example amongst many uh, to which we could add you know, hundreds of thousands of cancelled or missed hospital appointments, tests not taken and diseases not detected. We may add increased impairment in mental health and a rise in domestic abuse and the quite devastating effect on education. We could mention careers blighted and opportunities lost and the degradation in quality of life uh, that, the, that many felt in simply not being able to do the things that give their lives meaning, such as being with family and friends. Furthermore, these costs have fallen most heavily on the most disadvantaged. It is now widely recognised that many of the harms uh, just mentioned have been felt much more intensely by the poorer parts of society and also by minorities and those with disabilities. The widening of the inequality gap in education has been significant and is well documented. But the pattern is general. Access to public services, such as state education, the NHS, social services, public transport, citizens advice, the courts and so on, reduces inequality. Restrict access to these services, as the lockdowns did, and inequality increases. How were these costs factored into the details of the COVID response. It seems that they were not. Although the harms were predictable and even predicted, the government's approach was to put them aside, to be dealt with later and separately. The composition of the government's scientific advisory group for emergencies, SAGE, which drew up the government's policy, meant that it was not capable of considering anything other than COVID itself. Of the 23 individuals attending its early meetings in March and April 2020, 18 were medics or medical, biomedical researchers, one was a statistician, two were researchers into, the, into behavioural responses to health risks, and two were Downing Street political advisers. At that time, when the direction of UK COVID policy was being set, there was no one involved who could speak to the consequences of the proposed policies for any aspect of life other than the disease itself. There were not any senior civil servants present who might have been able to give a wider perspective. The sole focus was on combating the disease. So why did the government and the country more broadly take the approach that it did? Why was it not possible to take a holistic view of the benefits and costs of the policy? One key reason is salience bias. Salience bias occurs when one's attention is focused on one particularly salient feature of one's environment to the exclusion of others. A car driver is distracted by an arresting advert on a billboard. A crying baby causes a parent to forget about the cooking on the stove and so forth. As with many biases, they originate with cognitive dispositions that were and may still be uh, evolutionarily advantageous. Imagine being uh, one of our ancestors in the Pleistocene epoch, walking through the East African bush, an animal appears in the long grass ahead. It's good that one's attention and cognitive resources are all focused on assessing whether that animal is a potential predator, and if so, how to deal with it. If it is a predator about to attack, 
Nothing is more important than avoiding or defeating it. However, in more complex circumstances, such fixation of attention can be harmful. The salient item may not be as important as first thought, as in the driver case, and other potential threats are ignored. Or the salient item might be important, as in the case of the crying baby, but it might not be the only important thing, and one needs to keep other matters in mind also. Salience bias can affect organisations. A firm is fixated on its short-term profits and doesn't attend to its poor HR practices that will lead to longer-term damage. An army diverts its forces to defend against a diversionary feint attack, and so on. Governments can be victims of salience bias also. Some governments immediately saw the threat posed by COVID, especially those in Asia that had experienced SARS and other new viruses. Others were slower, but like ours, that did not preclude them from falling into the trap of salience bias. Once Boris Johnson had been warned of half a million potential deaths, COVID suddenly looked like a large and very threatening predator. Dealing with it seemed to demand all the government's attention and all its resources, and not just of the government, but of the nation as a whole. Very quickly, Everyone was talking about coronavirus. No other topic of conversation seemed important. The virus, mortality rates, infection statistics and R numbers were the principal news items for weeks and weeks. Salience bias is self-reinforcing. It starts when one item amongst the things of which we are conscious um, is particularly uh, prominent. As our attention is focused on that item, other things drop out of our consciousness. I'll add a, a metaphor of a, of a, of a, of a, a beam of light. Um, all around is dark and invisible. Um, so the salient item goes from being the most prominent thing of which we are conscious to being pretty much the only thing of which we are conscious. The composition of SAGE not only reflected the government's salience bias, but reinforced it by ensuring that the only information and advice it was receiving concerned defeating the disease, reducing infections, and minimizing deaths. Likewise, the news bulletins not only reflected national concern with the disease, but also meant that there was nothing, nothing else for us to be collectively concerned about, for we were given nothing else even to think about collectively. A key feature of salience bias is that salient items attract our attention by engaging our emotions, most obviously fear. The headline figures of deaths, repeated day after day for months, supplemented by many stories of individual suffering, suffering did much to keep our attention fixed on COVID. Fear of some bad outcome has the effect not only of maintaining our attention, it also falsely magnifies in our minds the chances of that outcome occurring. Even salience bias cannot last forever. In due course, other concerns came to, to government and national attention. Primarily other concerns concerning health, most obviously the fear, and entirely reasonable fear, that COVID could overwhelm the NHS. Matters not directly related to health took, later, late, took longer to be considered. Yet there is little evidence that they influenced government policy with respect to COVID. The best the government did was to put in place measures to mitigate the worst effects of the government's own COVID policy, which in most cases involved yet more expenditure. For example, the uh, education catch-up premium and the eat out to help out plan. It is unlikely the aims of such policies will be fully achieved. Other harms, such as domestic abuse, cannot be repaired in that way. There are many reasons why a policy might continue even when new information arises, most obviously institutional inertia. The latter was not entirely to blame since the government seemed capable of changing tack at various points. Why did the government decide to treat the fallout from the COVID response as problems to be dealt with later and separately rather than reasons to adopt a different response. An important factor was incommensurability, 
Incommensurability is the phenomenon of quantities, values, variables, standards, and so forth lacking a common measure. Without a common measure, it's difficult to decide what to prioritise. My argument has been that in deciding to implement a lockdown, policymakers need to weigh the avoidance of an increased in, increase in mortality against an increase in, for example, domestic abuse and against, domest, uh, against uh, de detriment to children's education, amongst many other things. But how does one do that? How much domestic violence is equivalent to the death of an 80-year-old? It sounds callous even to raise such a question. But such questions have to be in the minds of policymakers if they are to make the best possible policy. The calling methodology is a means of providing commensurability in healthcare contexts, but it hasn't been extended to other contexts, and it, you can see it would be difficult to do so. These problems are imponderable in the strict sense that we can't weigh the harms against each other. It's easier simply to ignore one of the factors, to put it aside to be dealt with separately. But this, I think, is bad policymaking. One needs to consider all the costs and benefits of a policy, even if they are incommensurable. That's why policymaking is hard. It is no news that we humans are imperfectly rational. As in the case of salience bias, some of these imperfections are the result of cognitive dispositions that serve us well in some circumstances, particularly those that require quick decision-making in contexts similar to those that were critical to the survival and reproduction of our ancestors. But those same dispositions can often lead us astray, especially in contexts unlike those evolutionarily critical ones. One central disposition of this kind is our tendency to think by using mental models, known as schemas, scripts, or frames, which encapsulate our expectations about how a uh, about a given kind of situation. For example, we all have expectations about how an encounter with the doctor uh, in a GP surgery will proceed, and the GP will have similar expectations with respect to her patients. This makes such encounters efficient and allows mental resources to be spent on the important details, recounting one's history accurately, thinking through the diagnostic options. Such scripts are often accompanied and enabled by paradigms, a particular model or exemplar of such an encounter. That paradigm might, however, encapsulate or produce biases, for example, by containing a harmful stereotype. The patient's paradigm of a GP encounter might, in the past anyway, uh, have involved a white male doctor. Uh, the GP's schema uh, for certain categories of patient might likewise incorporate biases. We in Europe have, I suggest, two schemas or mental models of infectious and transmissible disease. One is centred on the paradigm of the com common cold or a flu in a healthy individual, basically a mild disease, which is at most unpleasant, but not at all a matter of concern. The other sees infectious disease as foreign, deadly and very frightening. Ebola might be a paradigm. A combination of good public health and vaccines has largely eliminated serious infectious d disease from Europe. Uh, smallpox, rubella, polio, measles, tuberculosis, malaria and cholera, uh, which were once common here, are now almost entirely a matter of history. So we do not have a model of a serious endemic disease and no schema for thinking about and dealing with one. Perhaps we should, since flu and pneumonia kill thousands each year. Um, because those uh, kill people who are already old and infirm, we tend not to think of flu as a killer. So, in fact, we have only these two mental models of disease, and it's not surprising that our own government's response uh, shifted uh, from minimal concern uh, to lockdown quite rapidly. For the two models offered, two pictures of a response nothing serious to worry about, or something absolutely deadly that must be avoided at all costs. Given these two models, there is no intermediate way of thinking about disease in the way, for example, that our ancestors would have thought about smallpox or tuberculosis as a serious danger that warranted precautions and control measures, but not to the degree of shutting down society. Things 
look rather different from those parts of the world where transmissible disease is still common. And we've heard about this from Marmol uh, uh, just a few moments ago. Malaria, for example, kills more than 400,000 people each year, the majority of whom are children and pregnant women. Indeed, it's estimated that, get this, it's estimated that the disruption to malaria control in sub-Saharan Africa caused by COVID-19 brought about more deaths, uh, more additional deaths from malaria than were directly caused by COVID itself. COVID is a serious problem for Africa, but in terms of mortality, malaria is far, far worse. Nor is malaria unique. Lacking access to antiretroviral drugs, HIV AIDS remains the most lethal transmissible disease in Africa, killing twice as ma many as malaria. Diarrheal diseases kill about uh, the same number as malaria, meningitis and TB each half as many. Other diseases such as Bilharzia, dengue and yellow fever, while less deadly, cause debilitating illness and contribute to holding back the economies of developing countries. Africans, and uh, yeah, Arma's mentioned this, and I like, like that, that sketch that she, she referred to right at the beginning of her talk. Uh, Africans therefore have available to them many models of dangerous but endemic diseases. I suspect this is one of the reasons why Africa has fared relatively well. Of course, demography and climate have favoured Africa perhaps, but many Africans have surprisingly effective, well, surprising perhaps given the way, way things are reported about Africa that Arma's referred to, um, have effective community health systems in order to do things such as combat Ebola, manage malaria, implement polio eradication and so forth. These have been used to help people respond to COVID, while the population is also used to practicing disease control as part of their daily lives. Um, mask wearing, for example, was adopted much more rapidly across Africa than has been uh, appreciated in, uh, here. To have a model of and so to be able to contemplate serious endemic disease is not to say that one should simply uh, accept such a state of affairs. For a few diseases, eradication is possible, as has been achieved for smallpox, and as far as Africa is concerned, polio also. The question for any disease is whether eradication is a realistic possibility, and at what cost. It is estimated, for example, that it will cost about £140 billion pounds to eradicate malaria completely by 2050. Let us compare the numbers. The UK government has spent over £400 billion to prevent fewer than 400,000 deaths, whereas for a third of that cost in total, we could eliminate malaria entirely, forever preventing more than that number of deaths from malaria each year. As you see, I take a sceptical view of our government's lockdowns. Often people think that I'm also against mask wearing, that I believe in th that the harm of COVID has been uh, deliberately exaggerated, that I'm anti-vax, that I voted for Brexit. <laughs> None of these things could be further from the truth. Thinking that way is just another example of the bad thinking with mental models and stereotypes I refer to. There is no doubt that COVID is a serious and often deadly disease, and that the single best way to deal with it is the vaccine, which is why I joined the AstraZeneca vaccine trial as soon as I could in summer 2020. My point is, rather, that when thinking about public health interventions, social justice demands that we think holistically, which is to say that one must think of all the consequences of the intervention, not just the medical consequences. No doubt governments are beginning the process of revising their response plans for future novel diseases. And I suspect, suspect that most of those centre on quick and very firm eradication interventions. And that may be right. But should these fail, and we are faced with a disease will, that will become endemic, as is obviously the case with COVID from early on, we should have a more intelligent approach to thinking about how public health responses should fit into the bigger picture of our lives. Thank you.